Hello, uh, welcome all again. Today we have an exciting topic. It is autism and uh, speaking about autism, well, first and foremost, it is a lived reality, but it has various attributions. Uh, some say it is a spectrum, some say it is a inertness of the human mind, some say it is a condition of neurodiversity and many, many other views. And if you like, very popular celebrities, historical figures have been attributed autism as well. For example, Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, Wittgenstein, Mozart, Henry Thoreau, Emily Dickinson, Lewis Carroll, George Orwell. The list goes on, but if you say, but if you see, most of these are men. So, there is something about it. And today, we will just discuss about autism, its various aspects and so on. But I am not going to do that on my own. Wonderfully, I have here in the, on Skype, Dr. Shubhangi Vaidya. Dr. Shubhangi is Associate Professor of Trans and Interdisciplinary Studies at IGNO. She is not only an academic, she is an advocate of human rights. Uh, she is a mother of uh, a young adult with autism. She has written few books, and notably Autism and Family in Urban India. So, welcome Shibangi. Hello, Hen Chandra. Lovely to be on this program. And uh, see, before we get into the finer details of autism, uh, will you tell the listeners what is autism and how it is considered past and present? Sure. So, autism is one of the newly really identified disabilities, at least in India. And uh, if we look back at the history, we find that autism as a condition really emerged in the 1940s and 50s in the West. It was first identified by an Austrian um, psychiatrist by the name of Leo Kana, who uh, did a study of 11 children who, he, who came to his clinic and uh, who displayed certain behavioral characteristics, which Kana examined and studied very, very carefully. And one of the interesting things that he noticed about these kids was that many of them showed a certain kind of an aloofness. They seemed to be absorbed in a world of their own. They seemed to have a tremendously detailed kind of thinking. And in a sense, they seemed to be not quite part of the society in which they were born and were raised. They seem to be like little islands in a sense, you know, a, a persons kind of caught up in their own world, in their own way of thinking. And uh, of course, uh, it's important to state that uh, various disorders, various conditions are only really get a reality when they are named. But that does not mean that those conditions never existed before. Right. You mentioned a litany of, um, you know, uh, celebrities or, you know, uh, figures who are believed today to have had certain characteristics which resemble what we call autism today. Of course, we have no way of knowing whether or not they would clinically have been autistic because the condition really came to be identified and classified and discussed and categorized only quite late, which was in the 40s and 50s. And for a very, very long time, it was thought that it was an extremely rare condition. It was only in the 80s and 90s that the number of autism diagnoses, particularly in the West, started increasing exponentially. And there was a lot of talk then that there may be something called an autism epidemic. But if we look at the reality, you know, if we look at what a lot of scholars say, we find that it was actually, you know, a better diagnostic regime people actually had a name for certain conditions which may have 
earlier just fallen beneath the radar which may not have been identified at all which may not have been given a name at all so the important thing to note is that all conditions all disorders are not realities in themselves they are largely socially constructed as we you know understand in disability studies the disability is not just a medical condition it also has a social kind of a context around it and similarly in the case of autism we see that it is only when it is actually named it is actually identified it is studied that we then find a lot of autistic people around us people who would always have existed it's not that they were not there but we give them a name we give them a label only fairly recently and in in also we find that autism maybe a generation ago 20 years ago was not even considered a condition really that was uh, you know found in the indian context there were very very few doctors who were actually diagnosing persons with autism and once again it was only in the eight, in the late 80s and 90s that the condition started being diagnosed in a better way and more and more cases actually started coming out into the open so we see that even though autism may be a reality it may be a condition that is linked with a certain way in which the brain in, in, in which a certain way in which the nervous system has developed we find that in reality the actual diagnosis is something that is related to our knowledge about the condition and to social uh, situations and circumstances yeah i think uh, that's very well said because it seems in the pre modern era that is before the arrival of scientific ways of looking at it autism was and would have been considered uh, treated differently maybe the person it was tree it was treated as a personal difference uh, personhood difference and even uh, uh, a matter of divine intervention um yes actually the you know if you look at the history you find that in europe the concept of you know the divine innocent the sacred fool right these were ideas that were around for a very long time in in medieval europe so a person who really was not uh, you know enmeshed in the everyday um, you know uh, uh, hustle and bustle of life somebody who was considered very innocent in a sense somebody who was considered not having the guile or not having the social skills to really be manipulative you know such people were often called divine fools or divine innocents and it is quite possible that these persons actually lacked the social skills really to be the way you know they human beings are supposed to be in a sense which is able to understand the viewpoints of others able to manipulate and so on and so forth so in a positive way they were seen as having some kind of a special quality of innocence closer to the divine so these were ideas that have been around for a very very long time however it is only later that this so perceived inability to relate to the world to really understand social rules and norms comes to be seen as a disorder or a deficit and that is when this condition of difference is pathologized so uh, you know it's not that there were never people with autism autism is is a part and parcel of the human condition it is only that there is a, a certain point in human history when it comes to be given a label and when it is identified so these ideas of people who are different in terms of their, their engagement with the world people who are different in terms of the way they interact with others this idea has been around for a very very long time so uh, we often uh, you know in uh, if you look at the way in which uh, certain kinds of intellectual disabilities are conceptualized in in the context we find that you know very often people with who, who may have intellectual deficits are called seedha or bhola right or bhola right. yeah these are, these are not these are not patho- pathologizing terms these are in a sense almost affectionate terms mm. which recognize that a person may have an absence of guile or an absence of you know uh, the ability to really be manipulative or to uh, be uh, you know uh, to be to be able to use their thinking or their intellect in ways which other people do but these kinds of differences tended to be accommodated 
within pre-modern uh, social settings or you know where such people basically a place was found for them to do things that did not require a great deal of intellectual thinking and also we find that within the agrarian social context where work with your hands right work with the body was more important than any kind of intellectual Intellect, labor yeah. or mental labor so persons with intellectual disabilities things which would be recognized as intellectual disabilities today they really were not considered disabled they were perhaps considered simple they were perhaps considered innocent or gullible or easy to fool but they would not be considered disabled in the way they are within an urban uh, you know, modern context let's return to your point about kana and uh, clinicalization and so on um, first first and foremost i think conner is the one who uh, introduced asperger syndrome and later on subsequently in the medical history diag more diagnostic tools started developing mri is one but the notorious dsm classification and the icd classifications pushed autism to primarily clinical idea do you want to uh, walk the listeners to through that history sure. so yeah. what kana really identified uh, came to be known by the term infantile autism okay so if we go even a little further back the word autism itself derives from a word that was used by eugen bleuler who used the word b l e u l e r right u l e Yeah. that's right. right who used it as an adjective to describe schizophrenia right okay. and the early associations of autism were with childhood schizophrenia mm. very strongly mm. however later on it came to be conceptualized more as a neurological uh, disorder mm. rather than a psychiatric one so there is a long history here and you mentioned asperger actually asperger at the, roughly around the same time as kana asperger did a study of four young children or young people with aut with with certain kinds of uh, symptoms which were unlike those who, who were examined by kana because these children asperger's children were extremely verbal they were in a sense like as he described little professors <laughs> they had vast knowledge about uh, you know uh, topics of their interest they were extremely verbal however like kana's children they too displayed a, that fundamental disconnect with the social world they were fundamentally not cued into how to interact how to you know behave in a, a socially appropriate manner so this was the common thread that later came to be picked up by psychologists by you know by psychiatrists by autism experts who looked at this what you know to quote um, uh, uh, kana a fundamental inability to relate to the social aspects of life to relate to other human beings so this is what the core you know difficulty or the core deficit if we can use that term was detected in persons who got a diagnosis of autism later on it was the whole notion of autism as a spectrum really came into existence and uh, one of the important autism researchers lorna wing who really first brought asperger's work into the english speaking world it was lorna wing who spoke of autism as a continuum as a spectrum of characteristics and we find that on the spectrum and the way we now understand autism mainly as a spectrum there are individuals on it with severe impairment she she herself is a mother of autistic child is that true That's, yeah she had a daughter with autism yeah. so there may be persons with severe deficits or severe difficulties in speech communication imagination there may at on the what we call, call the more functional end of the spectrum there may be persons who may have very you know a good speech who may be able to communicate they may even be college graduates yet they may have this basic fundamental difficulty in relating to other people in understanding social cues in understanding the give and take of social life so in the this continuum there are all kinds of people and it's well known in it's a, it's a, it's very commonly said in autism circles that if you've seen one person with autism then you've seen one person with autism right so each individual with autism brings on the board their own 
you know, a huge variety of abilities, difficulties, and so on and so forth. So the notion of autism as a spectrum is really what is very widespread and deeply and, and, and well understood today. And you mentioned the DSM. So autism actually comes as a category, as a diagnostic category, only in the third edition of the DSM. And subsequently, uh, in the fourth, of course, uh, you had the notion, the, the, the idea of Asperger's syndrome, also as a part of the autistic syndrome. However, in the fifth edition of the DSM, which is uh, which came out in uh, 2013, autism and Asperger's have been fused together to form one category. So you no longer have two separate categories of autism and Asperger's. They are now part of one category. Well, so this uh, is uh, kind of why did Asperger disappear as a different separate category? Do you have an idea about that? Well, I think basically because, uh, you know, uh, it, they're, they're looking at the fundamental, uh, you know, uh, uh, problems or the fundamental issues that characterize the condition. So whether it is a person with Asperger's or a person with what we call classical autism, they display the same fundamental difficulties. However, a lot of people who had got a diagnosis of Asperger's, uh, you know, it, it kind of put them in a bit of a quandary. I mean, you know, do we come in the pale? Do we lose our diagnosis? And so on. However, uh, you know, I think due care has been taken to ensure that people who are diagnosed with Asperger's don't lose their, uh, you know, diagnosis. Because in many Western societies where there are many, you know, kind of facilities or many, uh, uh, you know, um, accommodations available to persons with a diagnosis, obviously the important thing is not to lose those accommodations or those facilities. That's right. Um, well, talking about social non-connect, mm. um, I gather that Baron Cohen was the one who designed some interview techniques uh, for parents and specialists, uh, special educators or psychiatrists to help them understand whether a child has autism or not. What, what? Well, been, yeah. Sorry. Yes, but um, is that still the gold standard uh, for diagnosis of, say, a child with autism? What, what, no, what are, is the scene? No, there are many tests. Okay. Which, uh, there are many diagnostic tests. Okay. Well, what Baron Cohen uh, actually uh, introduced was the idea of what, what the term called mind blindness. That's right. Which is a very interesting uh, term, you know, that the inability to read the minds of others. And Baron Cohen is, is, has done a great deal of research in autism. Uh, one of his very controversial theories is the idea of the male brain. So, you know, what he, what he is basically trying to assert is that uh, autism is fundamentally linked with, you know, the notion of maleness. I won't go into that, that's a debate for another day, but uh, <laughs> there are many diagnostic tests, there are mm. many, many uh, tests that have been uh, devised over the years, mm. uh, which, uh, you know, uh, are very handy in, uh, uh, you know, assessing or uh, diagnosing autism. And basically, any kind of a test that, try and, that diagnoses or assesses autism looks at the, um, uh, dif or the difficulties or the deficiencies in the main domains of social, imaginative, and communicative. Uh, that, that's right, the three domains. Yeah. Three domains. So, uh, you know, there are different tests that uh, kind of uh, are used within, in, within the Indian context now, and, and indigenous tools are being devised to be used within the local context also. So there are, there's, a, there's a lot of work going on in the area of testing and uh, 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 finding gold standard tools for uh, assessing autism. The local context. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, the, the talking about, did, did you say little professors? Uh, That's right. Yeah. That is what they, they seem to give the impression of being. Yeah. Well, uh, is that somehow connected to savantism uh, that has become a public stereotype about autism? That's a very interesting question and uh, this, this whole notion of the savant syndrome actually also became... Can, can you say uh, technically what it means so that uh, everybody right. knows what, what we are talking about? Right, so yeah. a savant is somebody who has extraordinary abilities in some, in a particular area. Say such so as math. Uh, so like math or music or painting. That person, the, the notion of the autistic savant or the autistic savant as a kind of a stereotype, as you rightly said, which has, you know, become, has really dominated popular discourse. 
is a person who may be extremely impaired in many areas of life but has one skill or one kind of a talent which is so extraordinary that that person is in a sense redeemed right so you know the people look for this savant skill in a person in order to in a sense make them worthy of being known or being worthy of being applauded and so on and so forth and in many ways this is very dangerous because most people with disabilities are like most people so amongst the non disabled population there may be a very tiny percentage who's got some extraordinary ability in the area of music or maths or painting or whatever but this is just a very tiny percentage and similarly in the case of persons with disabilities like autism there would be just a fraction of people with extremely uh, you know well developed talents in certain areas and then to look for that kind of a type in, in the average ordinary disabled person is in 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 many ways you know putting a certain kind of pressure to be what we call a super crip somebody who has some great talent in some area you find this in other in, in, in other disabling conditions also for instance people who are blind are expected to be great singers or have wonderful voices this is also a stereotype the right? case of the blind bard as they say exactly the, the blind bard or the autistic savant this is something which is a, is like you rightly said a cultural stereotype and since we are talking about culture i may add a very interesting um, uh, you know the way in which autism really came to be understood or known or regarded in the public sphere was based upon a particular film in 1988 called the rain, rain man. man yeah yeah so the rain man in many ways proved to be a, a film you know people first saw the film and then they saw the autistic person in many ways <laughs> that becomes so, history that becomes exactly. knowledge if you like yeah. it becomes a kind of a you know uh, it, it's so the, the talking about the rain man in the history the cultural history of autism is also very very important and the kind of character that was shown in the rain man you know dustin hoffman playing this autistic person who has been sent to an institution most of his life who is then discovered by his younger brother and then it is discovered that uh, the uh, the autistic brother has this immense ability to you know to to uh, to uh, cheat at cards or to you know, read the cards which makes him an absolute killer in the casino right so these are all it it made the film very interesting of course but then it also created the stereotype of the savant who is profoundly disabled in some aspects but has this one ability which kind of shines through the sea of disability yes. and also a kind of a robotic speech and uh limited body yes. movement and so on yeah exactly and you find that uh, when in india the or the film uh, my name is khan is made you know shahrukh khan very faithfully copies the mannerisms of dustin hoffman you know and uh, creates uh, a character who uh, sort of is the indianized version of the rain man so i think in ways, tamil we uh, there is this movie deva tirumagal uh, mm -hmm. where the male character is autistic Okay. and he has a claim for his daughter uh, and there will be a huge debate in the court of law mm. about uh, whether a man with autism can really be a father right so, i think there was a hindi version also of that film i, I heard that autism. my students were talking talking about yeah, it yeah 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 about a man with autism who then uh, wants to fight for his daughter in the court i think that's right like that's that. right yeah. that's so, right yeah that takes us to uh, the problem of causes what mm -hmm. cause autism mm -hmm. and that history is also very checkered Be mm -hmm. there is a neuro neurological explanation mri and so on psychogenic meaning how uh, maybe children are brought up in a particular family and mm -hmm. the family is neglectful it, here is where mother blaming comes there is this genetic explanation uh, genetics is growing leap and bound mm. so they, they those guys give certain explanation and there is this explanation of toxicity um, um around the globe we are just spoiling the environment and that has it seems has uh, cause causing autism and you did mention autism epidemic that's interesting hmm. because in us there was a study that said 
the spread of cable TV can cause autism. You know, so it, it seems the 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 cause, the problem of cause and its uh, uh, range. It it in itself it is a spectrum, if I may call it that way. Do, do, do you want to walk us through that kind sure. of history? So uh, there have been uh, many, many explanations or many, many, you know, theories, many, many pseudo theories about <laughs> what really causes autism. Mm. Now, uh, these causes also have been linked to cure, right? So right, you, can't right. A cure, you can't have a cure unless you have a cause. Correct. Now, the fact is that till date, we have no idea of the exact causality of autism. In fact, today there is also a debate. Like many medical conditions, we don't have a fuller explanation, right? So we know that yeah. it isn't any virus or any bacterium, right, that causes this condition. That that is uh, well established. Uh, what we do know today, let me begin with what is known today. Right. What is known today is that autism is a neurodevelopmental condition, which is a neurodevelopmental disorder, and it is believed that causes for it are largely genetic. Of course, uh, there has been a lot of discussion on the various causes that have, uh, you know, uh, that are believed to have purported to have caused autism. And one of the most pervasive, which you rightly mentioned, the psychogenic theory, was very, very mainstream in the 1950s and 60s. And it is associated with this rather dreadful term called the refrigerate mother. Now, this was a term that uh, Kanner uh, actually uh, uh, first introduced. And it was picked up, and one of the uh, most uh, well-known proponents of the psychogenic theory was Bruno Bettelheim, who uh, wrote this book called *The Empty Fortress*. Right, and uh, it was there. It was believed that the child with autism actually was retreating because he or she was unable to receive the warmth and the nurturance that was needed, primarily from the mother. So there was a pervasive culture of mother blaming that cold, professional, professionally engaged mothers. If, if you look at it in, from a local sense, you know, you, if, you, if you just look, uh, you know, in the Indian context, you'll find that there's a lot of mother blaming. Oh, yeah. I can, I can cite a Tamil proverb here. It's called Thaye Pule Pule Nule Pule Sele, meaning just like uh, the fabric um, uh, uh, the texture of a sari mm. is uh, comes because of the nature of the fabric, uh, and so does so will be the child with the nature of according to the nature of the mother, you know. Uh, quite. Yeah. 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 So the mother is basically seen as being someone who can make her child or break. Break her a child. child. Yeah. So if there's a disabled child, it is she who is seen as the, the sole person who can redeem the child, who can make the child. Or destroy the child for that matter. Or destroy the child, precisely. So, yeah. you know, if the child is doing well, you know, uh, it's because the mother has sacrificed so much to making the child do well. If the child is doing poorly, well, it is, That's it. she's not done enough. She's the finished. working mother is very often the most stigmatized. I know. She's working, she's neglected her child, therefore her child has turned out a particular way. So there was the whole notion of refrigerator mother was quite strong in psychoanalytical theory, which was a, a very much, uh, you know, mainstream in the 50s uh, and 60s in the Western world. However, later on, as over a period of time, it was found that uh, parenting really was not a determining factor. And one of the reasons, uh, and, or rather one of the important texts that came out at that point of time was this book called The Siege by a mother called Clara Claiborne Clark. Yes. Clark, sorry, not yeah. Clark. Uh, Clara Claiborne, who wrote a book on raising her child. Uh, her, little, her little daughter with autism and uh, I think th that book really laid mm -hmm. to rest a lot of myths about cold parenting, about you know aloof parenting and so on and so forth. Because remember if it was indeed cold parenting that would result in birth of a, or you know in the development of an autistic child, autistic children would not have had any you know uh, so-called normal siblings at all. All the children in the family would have been like that. Whereas the, that is certainly not the case. I mean, many uh, ch uh, children in, were born in families where there were other siblings not have any kind of a disability. So over a period of time, as knowledge about the condition and as research grew, it came to be, you know, more or less understood 
that the condition is not due to faulty parenting, is not due to cold parenting, but rather it is a, a condition, it is a, it is a disorder of neurological development. So uh, it is not, I mean, th this is basically the uh, current, uh, you know, understanding of autism. However, one, you mentioned the whole notion of toxicity. Uh, there was a very, very uh, uh, widespread kind, uh, kind of a panic uh, that kind of linked autism with vaccine overload. And one particular vaccine, that is the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine, the MMR, which is administered to children around the age of two. And interestingly, around the age of two is also when the autism symptoms are first observed or noticed. So Anecd anecdotally, is, right, by parents. Anecdotally, of, yes, yeah, that's yeah, right. Right. So uh, there was a, a there, and till date, there's a very strong kind of a lobby, which uh, you know, which uh, is talking about how vaccine overload or toxicity in vaccines is actually in some ways responsible for autism. However, the the scientific studies that have been done have proved or are, are, are show that vaccines have actually nothing to do with autism. But the jury is out on this one, and this is a debate that really refuses to go away. So there is a good deal of debate, where, and you know, and very uh, uh, polarized debate, I might add, between the anti-vaccine lobby, uh, as they are very derisively known as the the anti-vaxxers, or the vaccine <laughs> anti-vaccine moms. So you know, there's this very strong, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, divide that is uh, currently uh, taking place in this discourse. Uh, another uh, theory or another set of ideas, I should say, rather than a theory, is that the amount of environmental degradation, the kind of environmental toxins that are uh, widespread in all over the world now, may in some ways be responsible for causing not just autism, but many other kinds of, you know, neurological or neurodevelopmental disorders. Once again, the scientific studies on this have to be really seen and understood. And honestly, I'm not competent to talk about them, being a social scientist. So for me, the real concern is not how autism is caused or what are the you know factors which cause autism, but really once you know that a person has autism, how do we then create an environment or sensitize society or create an enabling world where persons with autism may lead a life of, of dignity, of worth, of value? So for me, that is really the important question. Certainly, yes. But uh, can you say something more about neurodevelopmental idea? Because development is a rather a holistic idea. That's and, right. Yeah, and you combine both neuro and the idea of development together. Do, do you want to say a little more on that, Shubham? This is not my idea, of course. It's, uh, uh, you know, neurological development or, neuro, or neurodevelopmental conditions are linked with the way in which the brain actually processes. Right. So, uh, autism is known to impact certain kinds of, uh, you know, neurological processes, mm. right? Clearly with regard to speech, with regard to imagination. So, it's, 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 a, it's a disorder of brain development in that sense, in, in, in that kind of uh, understanding. No, no, but, when I ha mm. asked that question, I had this dynamism in mind. For example, mm. so let us assume that uh, a child's autism is caused by a genetic uh, disorder. Mm. But uh, we never know how that disorder develops as a condition because it can happen in utero. It can happen uh, when the child is uh, interacting with the environment post-autumn. Uh, or it can happen as a uh, consequence of various other uh, forces coming into role. Uh, so uh, um, there is this dynamic uh, fluid causes going around the picture. Uh, that is what I had in mind. Yeah. I think probably in this context, the only thing, once again, like this is not my domain since I'm not I'm neither a psychologist nor a, a, a medical doctor. Uh, I think the important takeaway really that I can uh, you know, uh, get from here is that early intervention, the role of early intervention is very, very important and has been universally recognized as something being extremely important because if we work or if certain kinds of remediations are done with the child at a very early stage of their development, then some of the difficulties 
the child is then taught how to cope with those difficulties. So for instance, if we find you know a, a, a three-year-old who is not uh, really responding to responding, the world yeah. around her in a very um, you know a typical way, there are certain strategies, there are certain interventions that the parent at their own level as well as therapists or early intervention persons, teachers, the playgroup teacher can enrich the inputs that the child is getting so that those difficulties may be taken care of. For instance, we all, you know, one of the things is that a lot of, uh, you know, that, that, that is very, very, uh, you know, well known is that many children with autism tend to be extremely good visual learners. I see. So, you know, when they're shown a visual, uh, you know, kind of a, a information a cues or clues or given yeah. visual information, they tend to learn better rather than if they're just given a whole lot of words, a whole lot of auditory information that they may not be able to process very well. So if, if, if a small, if a very young child has been, you know, uh, assessed as perhaps having autism or showing, uh, you know, uh, symptoms of autism, if you bring in or introduce into their environment those kinds of um, uh, tools or those kinds of uh, inputs that will enable them to learn in a more easy way, that will enable them to learn in a style that is best suited to them, then this can certainly help them. Of course, it's not going to cure their autism because we do know that autism is not something that can be cured, right? It is a lifelong condition. Correct. However, how they cope with their difficulties or how they cope with the areas or, uh, with, in which they do have challenges, this can be considerably improved or this can be consider considerably remediated with early intervention. I think that is very important because like I think you suggested, the, the, the human brain is highly plastic. It is learning all the time. So the, the way in which we structure the learning experience for a child with autism is very, very important and can in the long run go a long way in helping that child to cope better with the world. Well done. So that takes us to the idea of activism because activism also has to do with this kind of remedial interventions. And it also has to do with uh, autistic people talking about themselves and their That's. and their caregivers. Mm. So and it seems because of the contextual differences mm. and this nature of activism differs from uh, mm. pl con place to place. Say in the West, it is uh, different from India. I think that is where the importance of your book, um, Autism and Family, in India comes uh, it's a major intervention in the field uh, I just I said a lot in a minute maybe can disentangle them and walk us through that right so uh, the book that I wrote uh, is based on my PhD uh, research mm -hmm. uh, which was a sociological study of families of children with autism in Delhi okay and um, it's basically uh, the, the work is aims at looking at the way in which families actually, uh, you know, accommodate a child with autism in terms of uh, the way they, you know, use their social and cultural capital to really make sense of the child's condition mm. and the everyday life that I think is at, at the heart of the work. Mm. How is everyday life with for a family with a child with autism? So uh, in this context, I actually looked at various dimensions such as how is how do you know how does a diagnosis actually happen when is it that parents realize that there's something about the child's development that is atypical how do they seek help once they have a diagnosis what do they do what are the differential responses of mothers and fathers sisters and brothers extended families and so on and uh, I, one of and, and one of the chapters is also devoted to civil society and uh, the uh, you know response of the wider society and I've also done a case study of one of the leading uh, NGOs which uh, uh, which deals with autism, and that is Action for Autism, which is in Delhi. So I have in incorporated a case study of that organization as well. So basically the book is trying to look at, the book which is based, as I mentioned, on my PhD research, it's trying to look at the way in which families actually uh, incorporate autism into their lives, make sense of the condition, and on the other side also make their child intelligible to the world 
so it is really a, a study in trying to understand the lived everyday realities of parenting and living with a person with autism i remember the case study of uh, divya and ashu hmm. um, and both from different classes hmm. and i also vividly remember your chapters on sibling uh, and si parental surrogacy that happens with a uh, sibling going with a child with autism mm. maybe you can uh, highlight on these things because many of my listeners will not have read your book maybe uh, walking us through anecdotes in the book and so on maybe more helpful sure so uh, let me begin with the siblings part that you yeah. mentioned yeah. Uh, very often we find that uh, siblings of not just persons with autism but uh, siblings of of persons with disabilities are cast into the surrogate parent role so boys are expected and here we see the 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 way in which gender plays out in very very stark ways mm. so we always find that a brother is expected to be you know the person who is going to look after that person for the rest of the life the you know the care the caretaker yes. or the, the you know the the protector protector the yeah the yeah protector for life you know mm. the surrogate father mm. the father figure who is going to look after this person and ensure that this person basically is taken care of for the rest of his or her life and the sister is actually the one who is the surrogate mother mm. who does all the dirty work so to speak that the mother also does mm. in terms of the actual rendering of care so uh you know some of the uh children some of the siblings i interacted with during the course of my study i can't tell you how humbled i was mm. because these were not children who were martyrs okay they were not wearing this cross of you know having a disabled uh, sibling <laughs> these were just wonderful naughty lively lovely children mm. who actually normalized their their siblings disability mm. in such remarkable ways i mean it really really humbled me mm. and uh, you know i think very often there is this uh, this notion of sibling rivalry which that's is a, a western, concept, very western idea a very western concept yeah. which we often tend to import into the indian context mm. whereas the sibling relationship in the indian context is very very different here siblings are not rivals they, you know even if you look at the cultural context this whole notion of ram and lakshman the notion of you know the the brother as being you know that the kind of uh, the the kind of um, uh, cultural weight that is given to the sibling relationship is something very very different from what we find in the west so to use the concept of sibling rivalry uncritically within the indian context is really you know i i did not find that uh, you know um, very useful at all and in fact what i found really interesting was the way in which like i was first mentioned gender plays out in many ways mm. uh, the way in which these gender roles tend to be uh, you know kind of uh, type cast and given to the male and female siblings mm. but speaking of the sisters what i found remarkable was the sense of responsibility that the sisters experienced mm. you know there were uh, there were some young girls who told me categorically that we will never marry unless we find a man who will be able to take me as well as my disabled sibling mm. along with them mm. you mm. know so or i will become you know i mean they had they had these notions of the sibling as being very much a part of their lives correct rather than someone who they wanted to shake off at some point of time mm. and uh, so so the you know my work with on 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 sibling ship was extremely uh, you know I, like i said it was very very humbling and coming to the case studies uh, that you mentioned uh, so we often assume that class plays a very important role in how a family copes with disability so we assume that a family that has got greater access to education to uh, you know uh, to resources is probably going to be able to cope much better than say a family who's poor who does not have access to uh, you know uh, the kind of resources that the rich family may have uh in, interestingly i found uh that there was really no such a predictable relationship between class and acceptance 
there was in some cases enormous acceptance of a child of, of a child with severe disabilities who came from a relatively poor family Correct. where the mother was at home the father was not in a very uh, you know highly paid uh, uh, line of work and he was not available until late night right i remember that's right yeah. so uh, you know the, the way in which that couple actually managed mm. the child it was remarkable and uh, it, it, you know so it, the notion of uh, you know having a disabled child as being in in, in a sense someone someone who spoils your status someone who is a kind of a slur or a kind mm. of a blot on the family correct this notion has really nothing to do with class at all mm. and in many cases you know you, you find that in families and this is anecdotal and not uh, cited from the research you see very often families who may be extremely well to do families who may have a lot of you know social capital may have a lot of status a lot of prestige and have a disabled member may very often hide that disabled member never bring that person out i am familiar with these anecdotes yeah so this yeah. is uh, this is kind of uh, you know uh, that person is, is is a blot or that person is a kind of a uh, you know a uh, uh, a taint which is uh, on the family's prestige or on the family's you know pride or whatever or inauspicious for that matter or inauspicious this is also uh, something that is uh, you know quite uh, frequently seen so uh, you know although the research on which this book was based was conducted uh, around 2005 to 2007 hmm. so it's been a long time now many of the children who uh, the, the families who I interacted with and who had young children at the time those children will now be adults Correct. and i think and i think the important it is very important i think uh, to have longitudinal research this is very very important you know to trace through the you mean of, intergenerational more than intergenerational looking at the way in which you know children what happens to them when they become adolescents mm. what happens in adulthood mm. so i think one of the areas in which uh, i am now um, uh, you know uh, going planning to do work on is in in the area of adulthood and i think this is also linked with my own experience as a parent Correct. because when i did the research my own child was a child and mm. today he's an adult mm. so you know i have personally lived this journey of uh, you know raising a person with uh, autism so what so about adult issues yeah yeah they're very interesting certainly what about activisms and their differences between the western world and here uh, they call neurodiversity and so on sure so there's a huge uh, difference of course i mean uh, we find in the west that there's this whole um, you know neurodiversity movement that has mm. been uh, around since around the 1990s can you say briefly about it what is neurodiversity sure Sure. So yeah. this word neurodiversity was first introduced by an Australian sociologist by the name of Judy Singler, mm. and uh, she kind of used it in a way to describe uh, how persons with certain kinds of conditions like autism should not be seen as disabled or you know uh, deviant, but rather should be seen in terms of the wide variety of the human family. So just like we have biodiversity in nature, we she spoke of neurodiversity in terms of neurological wiring, if you like. You know, so all of us are wired differently. All of us have got a different way of uh, being in the world. So this concept that's again a contemporary word. Uh, it's like hardware, software, exactly. computational software. in nature. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, interestingly, uh, now that you've mentioned computers, you know, the the whole world of computers and internet has been in many ways extremely liberating and rewarding for persons on the autism spectrum because it has enabled them to communicate and to interact and to express their experiences across spatial and uh, temporal barriers without necessarily having to, uh, you know, undergo the difficulty of face to face contact or actually the difficulties in you know the, the one on one contact that many of them have problems with and perhaps so sense, uh, yeah. develop positive and affirmative identities exactly so it's been a huge tool of identity formation hmm. and in the west uh, neurodiversity as a whole movement has really caught on there are many advocates who are uh, of neurodiversity within india it is yet to simply because in india the autism space is in a sense still evolving it is only with the rpda act that autism actually is incorporated in a in a right spaced uh, you know legislation earlier it was part of the national trust act which was primarily concerned with issues of guardianship and so on so now that uh, it is included 
one of the disabilities in the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act 2016. We are, I'm sure, going to find a lot more persons with, with autism competing for entitlements along with uh, the other disability groups. And this is bound to lead, I'm sure, to some sort of activism on the part of persons with autism themselves. We also find that a lot of children with autism who, uh, who uh, you know, you find every year, more and more of them are passing out from class 10, from class 12. Some of them are now going to college, at least in the big cities. We find that this, there has been definitely an expansion in their educational uh, opportunities and the fact that they're actually uh, participating in uh, the field of education. Uh, maybe 15 to 20 years ago, a child with autism would never even get admission into a school. I know. But today, yeah, but today you find that a lot, a lot more kids are going to school. There is a lot more uh, acceptance and openness of towards persons with autism. Of course, th once again, I may quickly add that this is probably towards children who are on the more, you know, high functioning end of the spectrum rather than children with very severe uh, disabilities. Disability. And this is very unfortunate because it's the ones with severe disabilities who really need more attention. More support. Yeah. support. Yeah. You so, mentioned... Op uh, you mentioned action for autism. That's what right. is it, Shibangi? Uh, it is one of the uh, leading NGOs. In mm. fact, it is one of the first NGOs that really um, uh, brought autism into the public discourse. Mm. Began. Um, it's a parent-driven organization, and it was basically a small group of parents mm. who set it up. Mm. And over a period of time, over the last several years, it has developed into an NGO which is looking at, uh, you know, early intervention, at assessment, counselling. There is a model school called Open Door School, which is one of the model uh, kind of schools uh, of its kind, uh, which is uh, uh, dealing with uh, or which uh, involves children with autism. It also has, an, a, you know, a vocational skill centre. So it is an organisation which is doing a multiplicity of activities and it is... And, and I must say that within the Indian context, particularly in the intellectual disability or um, uh, mental disability space, you find that it is parent-driven organizations, parent-driven NGOs that have done tremendous work. Okay, so there are many, many, uh, you know, uh, organizations like Tamanna, there's Muskan. There are many, many parent-driven organizations that really have started to, you know, this whole uh, uh, work of creating services and then gradually expanding into many spheres and in a sense uh, being parent driven they have been able to contribute information and contribute an understanding that comes from the experience of actually raising or living with a child with autism or any other developmental disability. So that's parental activism uh, for that's right. uh, people with intellectual uh, children with disabilities and so on but, and how long does it continue parental activism see now you raise a child uh, autistic child and now he's a young adult now so uh, mm. what is the nature of parental activism speaking from your autobiographical context as a mother well that's a very um, uh, you know uh, interesting question because so I, I guess a lot of parents, you know, one of the uh, major questions or one of the questions that refuses to go away is what happens to my child after I'm gone. You know, this is something which, which is a, a question that all parents of children with disabilities, physical as well as intellectual, grapple with in a sense. Because uh, in the Indian context, we find that it is the parents who have have to play the major role in terms of actually helping a person with disability to negotiate the world and to become independent. Frequently the stakes are rather, uh, I would say, uh, unhealthy uh, kind of a, a dimension in which parents very often may not want the child to ever grow up because it is always easier to take care of a dependent rather than leave that dependent to towards and you know, allow them to seek independence. Yeah. So there is a very beautiful term that um, that uh, that I really like, which is called dignity of risk. Sorry, until say that again. Dignity of risk. Okay. Until and unless we are okay. able to, or we are, we allow our uh, young people to have the dignity of risk, to let them experience independence and make mistakes if need be. I think. That is very, very crucial for uh, parental activism. I think it's very easy to kind of make you to infantilize your child and treat them like a child all their life. Forever. Yeah. Forever. 
Yeah. And it's not just the case for children with disabilities. I think you know the the the, uh, the trend is to for for or for all adults to be treated as permanent children. Never you know allow them to grow up. We find that with non-disabled people also to a great extent. You know adults who have never grown up because their parents just don't allow them to grow up. And that I think is doing a great deal of disrespect to the adult also and to the parents also. Because children are not meant to be extensions of you. You know, they are meant to be human beings. They are meant to be capable human beings in their own right. And unless we enable them, unless we empower them to exercise their individuality, become these capable human beings in their own rights, you know, I don't think it's fair to them or fair to ourselves. So where does parental activism end? It never ends. But I think parents as activists should also uh, develop an understanding and reflect very seriously upon whether uh, they are, in a sense, appropriating the child's voice, the person's voice, whether they are infantilizing this person with disability, keeping them a child forever, or what are they doing to ensure or to enable that individual to grow up and to find their own place in the world. Okay, I think that's the nature of uh, dyadic relationships. Uh, they refuse to die. Uh, and because dyadic relationships are also very strong. Um, right. So probably that's the reason. You know what, uh, this last one minute here. Um, can I ask you uh, about this? The learning that you have, uh, your learning as a sociologist dealing with autism i mean what did, did did it influence or or shape your idea of the discipline i know it's unfair to ask and ask this question in the last one minute but uh, a word or two looking at the issue of disability from a sociological lens has been extremely rewarding okay because uh, you know i think it really i mean it helped me to really understand the construct nature of reality at the same time, it also enabled me to understand how the body, because very often when we talk about just the social, we tend to leave the body out. So the materiality of the body, you know, what the body actually experiences, how so much of our experiences are rooted through the body. That's right. So for instance, a person with autism has got a different way of being in the world and there is no getting away from that. So that is something which we have to understand. We cannot reduce everything merely to social processes. Correct. Right? The so comportment the you, you are the, talking yeah, about. The, the materiality of the lived body. And mm. of course, you know, my understanding of gender relations, I think because the, the work has got a very strong gender component in it. Yes. And also looking at the way in which, you know, cultural conceptions of uh, disability, illness, disease, these are all very, very, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I would say things which uh, the disciplines of sociology and the disciplines of anthropology, particularly medical anthropology, really enabled me to understand in a much richer way. And uh, being a person who is, uh, you know, being a parent of a young person with disability also enabled me to get, get a much deeper understanding of my son as well. So I think uh, the, this disciplinary lens has been extremely rewarding uh, for my understanding. And I do hope that more students in the social sciences actually engage with disability and uh, specific kinds of disabilities also, so that we don't just restrict ourselves to medical or psychological understandings, but also look at it more holistically in a, you know, a, a social cultural uh, way. I would like to end there with that last sentence because that seems like a defense for this course. I mean, most students should enter right. with this <laughs> uh, great phenomenon. Um, I think uh, it was a wonderful time talking with you, Shubhangi. Same here. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think we just scratched the surface, but still we had good enough conversation uh, to go to the width and depth of what autism is and probably we'll do it again some other time. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah.